Great. Well, it seems like we've had a lot of people join, so I think we can go ahead and get started here. So first, thank you so much for joining the webinar today to talk about how to achieve return on ad spend in the absence of third-party cookies. So in this webinar, we have representatives from Google, Otterbox, and Dell who will be offering best practices aimed at marketing professionals who plan to execute digital advertising strategies and those who are just generally concerned about the impact of third-party cookies and IDFA deprecation on advertising ROAS. Obviously, this is a topic that has been very hot on everyone's radar and they're all very curious about knowing that it's going to really impact all of our businesses and how we do our jobs. So before we really jump into it, I'd like to introduce our panelists. So Betsy, I'll turn it over to you to start. Tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do at Dell, and a little bit of quick background on Dell in general. Sure, so I'm Betsy Sellers. I'm the head of media here at Dell. I oversee our programmatic SEM and paid social teams. Um, been doing this for about 15 years, so I've seen a lot of changes um, in our rapidly evolving industry in that time, having worked both client side and agency side. Um, what I really like about Delve is our focus on measurement first advertising. And we actually got our start within analytics first and then expanded into media from there. So analytics is really at the heart of everything that we do here. Excellent, thank you so much, Betsy. Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How long have you been at Otter Products and what's your role there? Sure, I'm Bill Linhart. Uh, I've been at Otter Products for about two and a half years. Um, prior to Otter, I had spent some time at uh, Microsoft and Facebook and ad tech. Um, here at Otterbox, I'm program manager for marketing analytics and technology. Uh, so really my focus is on maturing our marketing approach uh, through data and enabling enabling that data um, to reach all the teams across the company. Wonderful, thank you, Bill. And finally, Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you. If you wanna introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your role at Google and just general industry background. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everybody, Jeremy Woodley. I'm a director in the America's Platforms team within Google. Um, that's the former DoubleClick business. I manage all our non-traditional partners, our non-holding company partners, which include indie agencies, uh, system integrators, and um, channel resale partners like uh, like the current company, like Delft. Um, and uh, you know, my role lately, a lot of it's been an evangelist and somebody to speak and market about you know these changes and how that impacts marketers' ability to continue to use our tool sets and buy you know ad advertising through Google. Uh, uh, with our partners, which is a, a, a real joy because I have the I have the privilege of working with really advanced partners like Delve that understand how to do this and are really taking it to the next level and preparing for the future. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. Then I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Emma Marcott and I lead the Delve engagement consulting practice. So this practice within Delve is really functions as the primary point of contact for our clients in a strategic client success manner, as well as focusing on new business, and making sure that we're setting up our new clients for success across the board. We really function as the glue and in my role, you know, I'm getting questions often from clients to understand how is this going to impact my business and where am I going to go from here? So so definitely excited to jump into the topic with you guys today. So before we dive in, I think it would be very fair to say we're all still a little bit in the dark about what this third party cookie deprecation means for advertising and really programmatic advertising specifically, knowing that leaning into those third party cookies from a targeting perspective is a core component of how many of us run our programmatic strategies today. So just to reground ourselves before we really dive in, let's restate the facts that are in front of all of us. So privacy concerns really drove Apple to remove IDFAs, and now Google is taking a step forward to remove third-party cookies. So third-party cookie deprecation means that this will remove third-party audiences from a targeting perspective. As we know, third-party audiences are a really critical initiative um, for within tactics such as prospecting and retargeting within the programmatic space. And the programmatic advertising space is a $94 billion market in the US alone, or that's what it's expected to be in 2022. So uh, this has a really big impact on everyone here today. So when third party cookies disappear, some of the third party audiences will just inherently be less effective. And therefore that could create concerns that in this becoming less effective, that some of the programmatic advertising budgets will yield a lower ROAS. And this is exactly what we're trying to address today. So as an industry, how do we maintain performance? How do we maintain ROAS in programmatic advertising, given that these third-party audiences are soon going to be less effective than they are right now? And how do we navigate this future state? 
So thank you again, everyone. Really excited to be here. Really excited to dive into this topic, um, especially since we have representatives from all three sides. So a lot of different perspectives in the room today. We have the service side being Betsy, client side Bill, and then finally the platform side with Jeremy. So let's provide a little bit of context on our first topic. So Jeremy, I'll turn it over to you first. So why did Google join forces with Apple on the issue of consumer privacy? Yeah, it's a good foundational topic. Um, I, you know, the announcement that we had back in March was the the Google Ads business um, uh, deciding that we needed to take a position around uh, consumer privacy, digital identity going forward. Um, it is not a Google Chrome announcement. Chrome operates independently from us and makes their own decisions. Um, but I think what it reflects, both of the both sides of the company reflects, is a a, a belief that we have that there's a fundamental change in consumer um, sentiment around digital identity and consent around usage of that data um, that has changed in the last few years. That manifests in many different ways. You see, you know, regulations emerging in different countries and different states in the United States, like GDPR, CCPA, uh, and you see companies reacting to that as well and, and, and understanding consumers want more control over their digital identity, more ability to disappear or control the ways that the data is being used. Um, and Apple certainly has taken a leadership position around this so with, with its, their, their different approaches to, to identity. Um, uh, Chrome made the same decision. They're saying that consumers want more control and such. So I, I think the ads business, um, you know, obviously we rely on this, this digital identity deeply to be able to, to target and measure uh, the advertising we have, both on our own media and then on third party media. Um, but we also, you know, we have to understand the consumer's sentiment of change. They want more control. So, you know, our decision in, in March, that announcement was about setting a standard that we think is in, is well beyond, is beyond where the current like lines are in terms of laws and regulations, that consumers are going to want additional controls and additional um, restrictions on digital identity that will over time mean that our current architecture for managing digital identity is going to have to change. And we're going to have to move away from, you know, what we called a, a, predict, a precision era to a more of a predictive area, away from deterministic to probabilistic approaches. And we took a hard look at that and we decided we could do that, like that, that we can move away from the, the level of, of resolution we have around digital identity and use modeling techniques that are currently in place within our products or could easily be developed and, and display and, and deployed within the, the, the ecosystem to be able to do the major use cases and maintain the, the return on ad spend that we've seen in the past, but do it with, you know, taking consideration consumer sentiment and, and really respecting that their desires. That, that That's easy to say, but it's difficult to implement. So we started down this road now uh, particularly leaning on to partners like Dell to be able to like take advertisers through that journey because it does require experimentation. It does take changes to tactics and approaches, and it opens up doors to different ways of having relationships with that, with consumers that are important. Um, so it does require us to change. But I think we, again, going back to original point, it, this is about you know you know, we're not making decisions. We're reacting to how consumers are changing their minds about the topic. And and I, we think that that's so fundamental and important that we want to, you know, we made a big push and we're going to take a leadership position on the, on this topic. So that's sort of the general position. Everything falls from that kind of um, that, that positioning and that stats, that stance. Um, and again, we're here to work with the entire ecosystem, advertisers and partners, agencies, to figure out how to make this transition. We, we have total confidence it can be done. I think it's just a matter of the commitment and the taking the steps through that. And I do think we'll end up in a better place in terms of how we do digital advertising uh, fundamentally. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Bill, let me turn it over to you here. So what was your team's first reaction when you saw the Google announcement? Uh, in all in all honesty, the marketer in me was uh, completely disappointed, right? So, uh, and for selfish reasons, uh, here at, at Auto Products, we're at an inflection point with our technology. We're bringing our, our ad tech stack uh, in house. Uh, we're adopting uh, some of the, the Google marketing platforms. Um, we have made huge strides with our finance department in uh, measurement and building trust across the entire company. That as marketers, we are doing what's right for the company and we're using, uh, we're good stewards of the company's dollar. Um, and my initial reaction was, oh no, this is all going to go away, <laughs> right? Like everything that we just built over the last uh, two years um, or we're, we're working on today. Um, after taking a step back uh, and realizing that uh, particularly 
uh, if Google is on board with this, I have very strong faith that Google will uh, protect its own business and do what's right for the ecosystem as a whole, uh, just like Jeremy said. So I'm not worried moving forward. Um, it's just a lot more education that needs to happen internally, uh, particularly with our finance teams uh, and uh, building that, that company trust back again. Not that we've lost it, but just it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. Uh, from a consumer lens, I'm 100% excited about this, right? So um, I also, as probably everybody here does, gets tired of the uh, Criteo ads and you know being being hounded by those, and maybe that will that will level out a little bit, um, maybe not. Uh, but for our consumers, uh, we want that protection. We want to work with partners uh, and work with platforms that enable us to follow the, the government. Uh, rules uh, across the world, right? So uh, I'm excited about that portion of it. I think it's it's clearly the direction of of the future, uh, and we just need to sort of take a half step back, reset, and go forward. Uh, and as Jeremy said, it's it's going to be a lot less about um, individuals and and uh, what a, what their consumer journey was, and more about modeling uh, and how we play within that space. So I, I feel for us at Otter, like we're in a good spot uh, moving forward. Um, we have some decent first party data that we're trying to pull together uh, and utilize. Um, so overall, happy to see uh, Google make this move uh, outside of my day-to-day -day job. <laughs> Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. And then Betsy, would love to get your reaction. What reactions have you seen from Dell's clients? What was your personal reaction to this announcement? Sure, I think Bill recapped it really well. There was definitely some initial panic. I would say a lot of confusion just around timing and what are the implications. And, you know, it's not just the Google announcement, it's everything else that's out there in the market with IDFA um, and app tracking transparency, et cetera. So um, definitely confusion. It's also seen a little bit of, I don't know if it's quite denial, but like a lack of urgency around, well, that's coming. We'll deal with it when it gets here. But um, I think the recent iOS updates impacting Facebook campaigns has actually been kind of an eye opener for several of our clients. Um, we've seen metrics take a hit in the UI just because of that. And it's not because the conversions aren't happening, it's because they're not being reported out on. Um, so I think that that was a really eye opening thing that, hey, this can literally impact my performance metrics overnight. Um, we've also just seen an interest in partnering with Dell to really proactively prepare. So one of the things that we've been talking to a lot of clients about is Amazon intent data. You know, we'll talk, dive into that a little bit more later. Um, but the general mentality, I would echo Bill and Jeremy that we, you know, we're all in this together. We're all coming at it from different angles, but we really need to figure it out together as clients and service side and um, partners too. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I think that obviously um, we're on the same team here, but from our from our clients, there's been a stark shift in how they're approaching these conversations with some of the most more recent changes. When the announcement first came out, I think everyone was just a little bit of confused. And to your point, Betsy, it did create um, a little a little lack of urgency. But as clients have tangibly seen that change, it's really sparked a fire to set themselves up for success, which is what we want them to do in partnership. Um, with our tech partners to make sure that we're really ready when this happens. I think one thing, Emma, is um, a lot of what we're talking about is what I call a story, what we're losing. Um, mm -hmm. I think there is a positive story around this, um, particularly around first party data and around yeah. first party connection. Like it, it, in this new world, it, like it's gold, right? The more that you can have a direct connection to a consumer, a direct relationship with them and understand how they're reacting to different marketing and advertising messages and how that is driving outcomes you as a you know, brand care about, the better. And I think that's a real positive message. We've also seen emerge from the pandemic, you know, the, the explosion of digital touch points and the opportunity to change how you talk to consumers and deliver value to them. Um, that's the positive side of this, because that is like the foundation of both the activation and the measurement you need and and i think for most brands it's the way you want to go it's a, just a real positive direction it's easier for others than than than, than some for, than, than others but um that's an example of what i call a positive change to that and then also again you know really respecting your consumers uh you know, intent and, and desire about their data and, and about their privacy but anyway yeah absolutely couldn't agree more it's, it's definitely about a balance here with these changes
So as I mentioned in the opening, tech platforms are really leaning on third-party cookies to pre-package those third-party audiences to use for programmatic advertisers to make this a little bit more real for our audience. And given that Bill from Otter Products is here with us today, I wanted to give an example of what we're really referring to with this. So if I'm going to buy a new iPhone off Best Buy's website, a tech vendor such as Blue Kai could pixel me, and then Blue Kai would put me into a third-party audience segment called iPhone 12 owners. Now Blue Kai can send that data to a DSP such as DV360, and finally Bill's team at Otter Products could then serve pr programmatic ads for life-proof cases to that third-party audience since they know that they have an iPhone 12. This is, would, could be part of their prospecting efforts or their retargeting efforts. And with all of that, third-party audience targeting and programmatic will be adversely impacted by these third-party cookies going away, just given that clear example right there. So this is why brands who rely very heavily on programmatic advertising really need to pay attention to the third-party cookie changes and IDFA deprecation as you know, just using a very simple example right there, we're all really going to be impacted in that, um, in terms of that deterministic targeting. And to Jeremy's point earlier, we need to get comfortable and, and excel in leaning into that probabilistic approach. So let me turn to the panelists. So Bill, in the use case, obviously pick this because you're with us today, so it's very relevant. But does this use case re resonate with you and your team? Do you care that sometime in 2022 that the level of third-party audience targeting will be no longer possible? And how, how do you see this impacting your team or your efforts, really? Yeah, absolutely uh, care about, about third-party cookies <laughs> going not. our way. Um, really, what it's forcing us to do is push ourselves uh, across this maturity curve a lot faster. Um, you know, with that comes its own problems and priorities and uh, company uh, initiatives and things like that. Um, but we've historically been pretty reliant on third-party data within platforms in and of itself. So uh, I briefly mentioned the uh, trust between uh, marketing and finance and, and what we've done there and showing return. Again, the, the, my main concern at this point in time is, hey, great, look at our efforts from uh, 2020 and our efforts in 2021. And then when February of 22 comes around and everything tanks, uh, doesn't tank, it, it lowers uh, or it becomes less attractive, um, we have a lot of explaining to do. And obviously we can we can prep the company with that in advance and we've been doing education sessions across it. Um, but really uh, we've got to reevaluate the platforms that we use. And what we absolutely need moving forward is the ability to hook our first party data, uh, data into these, uh, into the platforms. Um, so at the end of the day, whoever makes that the easiest, uh, for people like us uh, is probably going to get our, our business uh, initially uh, with that. So third-party cookies, very much a concern for us. <laughs> um, we're prepping with it and we have to push ourselves uh, to move faster across it. So for, uh, I mentioned data also. So for us, we have uh, three or four different initiatives across the company on pulling data together in a privacy safe way uh, that we can utilize for marketing. So um, it's a heavy lift. Uh, for a company like us uh, to do that, but it's also a necessary list. This is something that we've been wanting to do for you know, the last five years is pull uh, warranty data with marketing data, with mm -hmm. sell through data from our dot coms, plus any in-store or channel partner uh, information we can get, right? So um, looking at the positives uh, for Jeremy here, uh, we're really able to push the company in a direction that we needed to go anyway to um, kind of justify our spend, become more efficient. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, ROAS is important, but I think our efficiency of our spend uh, is as equally important to us, right? So are we getting more bang for our buck? You never know when budgets are going to tighten or, or loosen. Um, so we need to be as efficient as possible. So uh, those are my concerns around, uh, around it. Yeah, absolutely. That all makes sense. I um, wanted to highlight a couple other use cases um, that the third party cookie removal will impact for brands like Otter Products. So we're leaning into prospecting in the example I provided before, but retargeting on mobile and desktop 
will be impacted as well. Partners that are re really heavily, heavily reliant on third-party cookies, such as Critio, should definitely be worried about this because it's kind of the foundation and the base of everything that they're doing. So when those go away, um, you know, the, the foundation crumbles a bit, right? And then another big one that we've been talking about is frequency controls, also on mobile and desktop. This will definitely be impacted. Marketers will be constrained in their ability to manage frequency controls and programmatic advertising understanding that those frequency controls are really dependent on cookies and understanding how many times you've hit a specific consumer. So those are just two additional sample use cases that illustrate why marketers really need to care about the third party cookie and IDFA deprecation, since all these techniques that we're all leaning into really heavily right now will be impacted. And then to Bill's point, we expect ROAS to be impacted as well. So we've talked a lot about what are some of the negatives um, that are coming from this, but let's really turn, flip the script and focus on the glass being half full. So another question for our panelists. So if third party data cookies are going away and brands may and likely will see diminishing returns with their third party targeting strategies and programmatic, what data would we advise them to look for? How, how can we try and maintain ROAS in this world? So Betsy, let me turn this to you. What's your reaction to this and what's your advice? Sure, so you know, obviously Jeremy spoke a little bit about the probabilistic side as well, which will be very important, but there will still be deterministic data available. And so it's important to look for that data that is de deterministic um, and has really strong and well-defined intense signals. So one example of that would be within Amazon DSP, which this offers a pretty compelling data set that allows advertisers to leverage intent data such as product searches, product views, um, product purchases. And what's interesting is you can use it not just from an inclusion standpoint, but also from an exclusion standpoint. So a couple of practical examples there. Um, auto products could actually include users who are in market for a new phone as demonstrated by their product view or search behavior within Amazon, but also exclude users who recently purchased a case from some of their major competitors. So just kind of a practical use case there, um, highlighting that. Awesome, that's really helpful. And then I guess, is Amazon the only example of how brands can lean into intent data or are other partners doing this as well? Yeah, definitely not. Um, Google, Google Shopping um, are great sources of intent data that can be leveraged for audience targeting via DB360. So practical example here, again, for Otter products would be maybe within some of the lower funnel advertising efforts. Otter could target users searching for iPhone cases on Google Shopping, um, you know, pick that up and, and target via DB360. Or for more mid-funnel efforts, um, you might want to target someone who has recently searched for how to transfer contacts to a new phone um, or best Android phone reviews, that kind of stuff. Really quick awesome. to chime in. Really quick to yeah. chime in on that. Sorry, Emma. Uh, absolutely right. And th these are tactics that we do use, by the way. Um, but uh, the other piece of missing information here that that we've just begun to use that we uh, commissioned a, a consumer journey um, study, uh, which helps us. Uh, essentially reinforce our, our thoughts and our gut feelings around the intent data, right? So we know that uh, user sees an ad, a uh, display ad, they, they do a search on Google, uh, they come to uh, otterbox.com, they bounce out, they see another ad, and then they end up at Amazon or, or some other third-party marketplace or going into a store. So we're really trying to utilize that consumer journey uh, information that we have plus the intent within platforms uh, to be a lot more effective at the end of the day. Awesome, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Bill. And I guess, Jeremy, let me turn it over to you. So coming from the Google perspective, how do, how do you see brands leaning into Google's intent data for their advertising? Well, yeah, I think um, increasingly, you know, having a backbone of first party data will be really critical. You know, we're gonna be talking a lot about a, a feature of our platform called customer match, the ability to import you know, email addresses, particularly to be able to match to our identity and then be able to use that to extend to similar audiences, to broaden your reach. So that's within the Google universe, right? That's a good practical use case. And we're gonna be really leaning in to more tools to be able to take data, first party data, consent, you know, consented data from uh, consumers uh, and be able to use that to create the right messaging and marketing to them at different moments. So, it, and, and, that, and it's very, like it's a fairly new feature in some respects and it'll be developed and made better over time and, and such. I think 
the other thing to think about is, you know, in terms of out there experimentation coming, the privacy sandbox within Chrome, you know, the the the, the different proposals out there would recreate um, audience-based targeting that we see through, you know, audience lists today, like you mentioned earlier in that example around, you know, iPhone 12 users, um, all, and uh, the ability to replicate remarketing. Uh, retargeting also uh, using that those those are in experimentation you know they're still being developed and finalized we will integrate those into our products to enable that functionality in the future so the platform will support that uh, and our commitment as a platform company is to mask some of that complexity so that you know an advertiser doesn't have to understand the sandbox necessarily just to understand that we can replicate that audience-based targeting and you know, options we had in the old, you know, cookie-based world in a, in a world without cookies and, and work across different environments, whether that's Safari or, uh, you know, Chrome or, you know, an app app environment. Um, and in general, like, one thing to think about is, like, there is actually a fair amount of modeling already built into things like frequent, fre frequency and reach management today because of the lack of data that we have already. You know, the deprecation of mobile identifiers, particularly within the, the Apple environment, I think the numbers we're seeing, 60, 70% of current programmatic addressable media just doesn't have an identifier. I mean, has identifiers, at least 30 or 40 that doesn't. And, you know, we see models going down to 10 to 15% when cookies really do get deprecated, you know, in 2022. So, you know, you're going to have to have a strategy there. But know that you already have the tools like ours are already thinking about that. So we're already modeling frequency and reach management in, in the current tool because we don't have 100% identity to be able to do that. And we've been having, having to do that for quite a few years. So there's a lot of this is more in progress than the average user. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful context. Thank you, Jeremy. Perfect. So let's let's center the conversation now around first party data. So today we've really been talking about the changes in third party data and, and what that means for ourselves as advertisers. But let's lean into first party data now to understand how can we best use that to support this change. So in the spirit of keeping this actionable, I'll give another example similar to the way I did at the beginning. So if I search for iPhone cases on Google, I'm actually leaving my personal intent data with Google. So that's why the large tech partners such as Google, Amazon, Facebook are so formidable because they have access to this really powerful intent user data left by consumers. But so this is really foundational to our conversation. Similarly to Google, Amazon and Facebook, brands can also do that. Brands can also generate their own first party intent data and then use it for really powerful and actionable advertising. So let's talk about the brand's first party data here a little bit. So there's a number of different types of it. If we start at the top of the consumer journey, the focus on data that consumers leave behind when they browse a brand's website or app. The web and app is captured in the brand's on-site or in-app analytics solution. So if I go to autoproducts.com, I'm browsing around, I'm leaving my intent data on that site and it's captured by systems that they already have in place. So Jeremy helps set the stage for us. So Google's working on the new GA enterprise. It'll store web and app data. Will it be affected by third-party cookie deprecation and IDFA? Yeah, well, it certainly will. <laughs> That's a major driver of how <laughs> you know, track, you know, and understand what consumers are doing on, on different sites via a product like GA. Um, I, I, the commitment we have that we've been very public about is we will migrate the, the, the use cases that are within GA to this new world over time, As and we're figuring that out. I, you know, I don't, I'm not a product person. I don't know exactly how that will work, um, but the commitment is to be able to migrate all the major use cases for GA into a world when cook, where cookies are not available. Uh, which includes, you know, the ability to use some of that data around consumer usage, that first party data, again, that you have as an advertiser to be able to, you know, use it within the, the, the ads products we have. Um, that said, like, I can't go beyond that because honestly, it's in development. That's part of the journey that we even have to go through. You know, when, and it was a, it was a pause moment. I, I know that our product people and, and leaders are very nervous about this because it does require a bit of a leap of faith that we're going to make it happen. But I think that what I've heard is that we, you know, the, 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 this really thought leaders within the organization feel and see a path to that and that we're committed to making it there and we'll work with our partners like Dell to be able to like, you know, walk through that as it emerges. But that, that's a commitment we have. Have is again, as I said earlier, to support the advertising use cases out there today with our platforms and, and this new environment. We, we will find a way and we see a way to get there. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Then I guess, can you speculate on how the impact of third party and IDFA removal 
will impact Adobe Analytics. And as full disclosure for the group, Delve is a GMP partner and reseller for GA360 and the new GA, GA Enterprise, but we are also well aware that Adobe Analytics is a really large competitor for GA360. Yeah, I honestly, you know, it's funny, I haven't had a chance to talk with my Adobe counterparts. I know some people in that business, you know, you know we're all a fairly small industry in some respects about their approach. My, my honest uh, feeling is they're, 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 it's a big, very well-established business. Uh, they have a lot invested. They're going to have probably a very similar approach that we do. I'll, they'll figure this out as well. Yeah. Um, it's too important to their one of their core use cases. I mean, I think it's certainly GA4, GA, uh, Google Analytics, like we really do lot, rely on the marketing analytics use cases out of this. Mm -hmm. The marketing use cases versus the analytics, I think they may be you know, more centered on that, but have a lot of marketing use cases. But they're going to find a way to make this work, like just as we will. Uh, as an industry, we all need to do that, you know, to be able to transition to a new world without cookies and still be able to, you know, support the advertiser's needs uh, around the use of the tool. So I, I, I don't I don't personally have a lot of insight in that. I'm not a product lead within Google, so I don't know as a competitive Intel, and I don't know people over there that are telling me anything. But I just having known a lot of the people over there, I know they're going to be working on the same problems and have, you know, similarly highly capable people who will figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. That's fair. Thanks, Jeremy. So let's let's talk about brands first party data. And for now, still in the context of data that consumers leave at the beginning of their journeys, i.e. brands app, website, first party data. So, Bill, let me turn it to you. So what's your perspective on the role of web and app, web and app analytics tools such as GA or Adobe and how can they improve advertising performance, particularly understanding the context of collecting first party data? Yeah, for us, it's foundational uh, at the end of the day, right? So user comes to our site, we need to know the consumer journey when, when they go to an information page, when they look at a product grid, when they're interested in the product, what color they choose and whatnot. All that's foundational for us because then we're going to bucket them into di differing audiences across the board. Uh, and then we're going to feed it into our, our ad platforms at the end of the day. So uh, first and foremost, foundational in building uh, and understanding the consumer journey and, and consumer audiences. Um, but more so on how do we measure success from an, uh, a media side uh, using GA? We are, I won't, our ecom team won't like this, but I would, I would argue that we're probably in GA uh, more than they are. Uh, and what we're looking at is uh, essentially, are we sending qualified audiences uh, to the website? How long are they spending on the site? How many pages do they go through? Um, what was was our call to? call to action effective, was that landing page working or not? Do we need to switch it? So um, all of that uh, is super important for us uh, and will alter our media plans and our creative based on how um, consumers are, are coming to the site and what they're doing there, uh, right? So ultimately all we wanna do is shorten that consumer, consumer journey. Click on an ad, get to the site, purchase, repeat. Um, so GA, is, uh, GA and, and, and analytics, web analytics are super important for us as a media, a media team. Yeah, absolutely. And then Betsy, what's your perspective? So I know you're leading a team of 25 plus media traders managing a ton of media for Delft's clients across search, social, display. Can you talk a little bit about how web analytics is used to lift advertising performance on a day-to-day -day level? Well, Bill actually just outlined a bunch of the best practices that I was going to talk about, so that's covered. Um, I would just add a couple of things. Like we, um, our traders are in there and really look to understand the conversion funnel metrics. So at every step within there, where is the drop off, um, you know, and how does that vary by media source or traffic source? Landing page testing is another big piece of it as well. If someone's, you know, getting to a page and bouncing, maybe that's not the right page that's meeting their needs. So that's something we take into consideration. Um, segmentation, as Bill mentioned, and then also audience suppression. And so, you know, in that example of somebody coming to the site, bouncing after five seconds, maybe I don't want to serve them 10 more ads. Maybe I want to suppress that audience. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. That's really helpful. So as we take this a step deeper, first party data isn't only data stored on apps or web analytics solutions. It also can be data stored in the lower half of the consumer journey, such as customer purchase data that brands can store in their data lake or CRM system. So for example, at Delve, we see a lot of brands using a combination of their app, web, and customer purchase data for some really key use cases, such as predictive lifetime value. So to focus media on acquiring customers who are likely to buy again and again, really leaning into that loyalty 
perspective. And then next, best action and personalization. So using past behavior to inform what products we could serve someone next or what products we should recommend them based on what we know about them as a consumer. So Bill, leaning into the personalization perspective, how is Otter Products using first-party data today to deliver a really good user experience and really focusing on both the predictive lifetime value as well as that next best product? Yeah, I, I would honestly say we're we're in the learning phase of getting good at this. Uh, we are definitely, uh, there's a curve to it. Um, really for us, uh, we utilize the Google platforms and, and Facebook platforms and, and we're pretty reliant on on those al algorithms to deliver the, those uh, personalization uh, to it. But we are using first party data and pushing it in uh, to various platforms around the segmentation, just like we were talking about, right? So iPhone user, recent purchaser, who, who should we cross sell, upsell in 60 days uh, for mm -hmm. screen protection or, you know, uh, accessory of some sort of um, product like that. Um, so for us, we're trying to consolidate our, like I said, all of our consumer data into one spot, utilize that uh, and, and push that out for us. So um, personalization goes beyond just ads for us. Obviously, we want to uh, replicate that on the on the site um, as a person enters uh, the, the, the site, give them exactly what they're looking for. If they're an iPhone user, only show them iPhone products. If they're Samsung, you just show them Samsung products, et cetera, and then try to cross sell up, sell from there. So uh, super important for us, uh, and like I said, we're we're really trying to learn as as we go. Uh, we do know it's all about shortening that that consumer journey at the end of the day, like I mentioned previously. Yeah, absolutely. And then I guess tying it back to um, our conversation on ROAS at the beginning, do you think that a better user experience, talking about personalization, leads to a higher advertising ROAS? Yeah, absolutely. Again, uh, back, going back to the conversations we've had with our finance teams and, and being good stewards of our dollar, um, shortening that journey, the less money that we that we spend acquiring uh, a consumer is profit for the company at the end of the day, right? So um, the better the user experience, the more likely they are to recommend, the more likely they're to come back. We create this loyalty, we create the flywheel, um, yeah. and everybody's happy at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I, just to jump in, Google's seen the same thing across our businesses that um, small tweaks in mobile experience in particular can re result in vastly better conversion rates and better R and ROAS uh, on the advertising, which obviously we care a lot about. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the advertisers, like it, 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 a focus on a better mobile experience is, a, is an easy lever, not easy, but a, an obvious lever to be able to pull. And also related to that is better commerce capabilities, better better shopping cart experiences, better recommendation engines, all, all not easy to do, but all things that I think we all, we all seen as consumers and other places that do it well, you know, notably Amazon. Um, so, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of tweaks and, and improvements we can to the, make to the first party experiences that just improve our, our ROAS throughout. And what's interesting is the, the way I talk about it is a, there's a spine of deterministic data in there, right? You can, you know, even with the cookies going away, some amount of those users, you're going to be able to understand that you you served them an ad, they went to your site, they bought something, they bought something again. You have a, a sense of like return of investment that's kind of hardcore, and you can use that to model. You can say, well, you know, this is the environment I, I advertise in. These are the what I advertise them with. This is the tactics I use. That, that then you can extrapolate, say, in general, will generate this amount of business for me on my website. And then you can start to understand through that journey how to optimize it, how to optimize the targeting and the advertising itself, the creative, how the optimizing the the, the, the site experience, uh, the shopping cart experience can improve that. And that those are the tools that we want to empower the advertisers to be able to like really understand and be able to go to activate yeah, just to, yeah just to fill in that really quick like that's it's a uh, changing the culture at least with it within otter uh for teams working together right so how can the e-commerce team help out media team how the media team help out uh the e-commerce team uh and all of this data and all of these tools that google that google has uh is allowing us to do that uh so we're really all rowing in the same direction where previously we might have been in a few different silos and kind of having our own agenda so uh, all of this is to make the company more efficient as well. Yeah, one of the interesting byproducts of this is that I think there might have been a false specificity of cookie data and, and ID, IDFA mobile identity. 
that, you know, in a digital advertising world, we're like, we're going to tie it all together and have a lot of data to understand the full purchase path and the multi-touch attribution models and such. Um, but that left out a lot of advertising methods that are highly effective that we don't have that level of digital identity to be able to track. And so as a marketer, you'd have to like make evaluations, different different media mixes. So the MMMs still have a lot of value because of that, right? I do think there's a moment where we can maybe step back from that false specificity and use modeling to understand programmatic, you know, like digital advertising, but also to understand those same models can evaluate the, you know, direct mail or radio or television advertising potentially. You know, for me, it's exciting because I think it might, might make our ability to understand the full journey of a consumer better if we embrace like more of a probabilistic, you know, model-based approach. And I think that's better for the marketer at the end of the day, and honestly, for consumer experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess, Betsy, on your end, how, how has your team been using PLTV Insights from Delve's data science team in media management? How can we really tie that back to the actual performance? Sure, so I can give an example. Um, we've worked with Stride Gaming out of the UK, a big online gambling gaming client there. Um, and we worked with them on the creation of a machine learning algorithm that would allow for bidding to a predicted uh, future value of a consumer. And so this really, the end goal here was to shift the marketing spend toward the acquisition of those high value users. And we see this, this is applicable, applicable across many different industries. You know, not all users are created equal. So how do we make sure we're going after those high value ones and not just the ones that maybe convert once um, at a low amount? So what was unique here is that we included the offline conversion data as well. And as a result, it was able to actually predict user LTV with 88% accuracy. And so the team, the marketing team was able to take this and reallocate budget, um, make sure that we're targeting the most, the users that had the highest potential to be high value. Um, and you know that's kind of an ideal state and we're seeing a lot of interest from our clients right now on getting to that ideal state. We have a lot of data lake projects in the works um, across numerous clients right now in partnership with Google. Um, and it's, you know, another example is that it's highly, highly applicable to our nonprofit clients. So, um, you know, you might get that initial single donation from someone, but then how do we convert them into a monthly donor and can, and um, keep them engaged over a longer period of time? And PLTV plays a big role in that. Yeah, absolutely. It's really great to hear that clients are, you know, taking an interest and in taking the steps forward right now to set themselves up for success with these different tools such as data like CDPs to ensure that we're empowered to use first party data when first party data is really going to become king. Awesome. So one last topic. I know um, we want to make sure that we leave time for some questions here. But BCG recently stated, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, that brands that embrace their own first party data can increase advertising ROAS up to 60%, which is, which is a super high number. And more interestingly, only 2% of brands are really using their own first party data to create a seamless cross app web store and call center ex and personalized experience. So, Bill, with that, what is your POV on the above statement? I know we've talked about this a little bit already, but does Auto Products see a bigger opportunity today in using first-party data to improve ROAS and deliver a really personalized experience, or are both really equally important for your business right now? Yeah, so both are equally important for our, for our business, uh, but if I had to choose one, uh, I'm going after uh, ROAS. I think it's our bigger opportunity. I kind of alluded to it before, right? So budgets shift and change and move around. If we can be more efficient with our dollars uh, across the entire funnel, uh, the more trust is created, the bigger the budgets we get, the, the happier the company is at the end of the day. So um, it stretches our dollar a lot further. And so that's why I want to focus on that. Uh, and then once we improve, sorry, prove out that impact, that conversation gets a lot easier um, with everybody throughout the company, the C-suite, et cetera. Um, personalization, is extremely important to us also. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I put that secondary though. Um, we want personalization. We want that consumer experience to be seamless, just as you, as you mentioned across the board. So uh, we want to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time. Where are you at in your own personal journey? Are you are you in discovery phase? Are you, are you doing research? Are you about to purchase and, and just looking for the lowest price you can possibly get? So the better that we can get at messaging that person in that moment, will drive that efficiency, which will drive that ROAS, which will keep keep that flywheel going. So um, from a business perspective, I like to focus on ROAS, um, but you can't have uh, 
a better ROAS without that personalization piece at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And so I guess, Jeremy, Betsy, I'll turn it over to you guys. So Jeremy, any any closing thoughts on this topic or really anything that we've discussed today? Um, no, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, I, 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 I don't want to oversimplify, but I do think this is a journey we're all taking together. Um, right now, we are in a world that, you know, cookies have not disappeared. Identifiers are out there. So you have to, you know, you want to continue to use the tools you have available to you. Um, but I think it's important that you start to invest in the in, in durable tactics and experiments in the new world that are make sense for your business as a brand, like the where you have levers that are that you can pull and you can start getting down this road. I, I think I, I tried to talk not just about the negative use cases, but some of the positive use cases, particularly around first party data and consumer journeys. Like there's just a lot of interesting things we can do as an industry to improve that and tie that together and stitch it together better. Uh, but you know, again, we this is a journey we're all on together. Google is here to provide, you know, a, advertising platforms and me advertising itself to kind of help marketers achieve their goals. You know, our, our our mission is to make sure that we 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 provide a future and a way to that path. But that doesn't happen without a delve. Uh, it doesn't happen without an otter. You know, it doesn't happen without all the constituents of the ecosystem. So it's a process we'll have to go through and we'll have to to invest in over time and. Uh, and so I, I, what we're looking for is engagement and experimentation and an adoption of some of these tactics that make sense to your business as we make this transition from today to the tomorrow. So that, that's sort of my big message and uh, excited to do it because it's, uh, it's an exciting time. I started in this industry right as our RTB emerged and ProGrack Media became something we could do. And it reminds me a lot of that in the sense like there's a lot of change. And, that means that uh, those that are paying attention and, and adopting trends and getting ahead of this is gonna are gonna do better in this new world. So you know, I encourage everybody to take a hard look at it and think about, you know, what are the the benefits to your business and also the negatives. Like, let's be you know crystal clear about that. And talk to your partners, talk to other people you know, and start to invest right now. Yeah, absolutely. As always, change presents opportunity. And to your point, Jeremy, it's about who who is ready to take that opportunity. And, and those are the people and the brands that are really going to come out on top. Yeah, Betsy, absolutely. any closing thoughts on your end? Yeah, just piggybacking off the change. I mean, I think that's what keeps this industry interesting, right? Like I'm, I am never, ever bored at work, um, you know, and there's always something something new to learn or to test. And I think to, to Jeremy's point, the time is now to start with that testing, um, you know, big or small, just start prepping for the changes now. They are coming um, and we're, we're happy to help with any of that. Awesome. Thanks, Betsy. So in closing, the new GA free and, and GA 360, the paid version, um, will be available for whitelisting beta as soon as this summer. And, and really our recommendation, and of course, as a, as a GMP reseller, would be to get ahead of your first party web app data. And we definitely consider upgrading to GA360 now if you're um, not using GA360 or you're not using the paid version of GA360. So, well, that's really all the questions that I had for you guys today. Jeremy, Betsy, Bill, it was it was certainly a pleasure hosting you guys and really appreciate the thoughtful and strategic answers. We did want to leave about 10 minutes here for questions. Um, so I don't see a ton of questions right now. We do have one question here and Jeremy, I'll direct this to you. So let's talk a little bit about the time frame for this change. So I know 2022 is kind of what's on the radar. Is there any more information that you have to share? Um, yeah, I, I mean, this is where we are uh, listening to others as much as you're listening to us. You know, it's really, in some ways, it's it's Google Chrome's decision. Um, yeah, it is absolutely about how they handle cookies. The the what they've told and said in market, and it's been very they've been very transparent is that that they are going to migrate to a world without cookies, but they're going to do it when the advertising ecosystem is prepared to make that leap, so mm -hmm. that that we can support advertising use cases. Um, that's what the sandbox is all about. That you hear a lot about and developing things like flock and fledge, which is the audience targeting and the remarketing kind of option in the future. There's a measurement version coming soon that will be out there for for testing and experimentation. Um, so I think it's it's going to be a prog a pro process. You know, in terms of absolute timelines, you know, I, we're we're guessing, and it's honestly a guess, 2022, um, mm -hmm. sometime within that year. Um, you know, I can't speculate any further more that than that because I don't know. Um, but I think what we as an ads business wanted to do is to you know, to tell people that we saw this coming. We're reading tea leaves this way. We want to respect consumer consent, so we want to start setting 
you know, uh, start our own evolution of our platform toward more of a probabilistic, you know, uh, a future, predictive future, and start to experiment and, and look at opportunities right now, even with cookies and identifiers being around, that we can start to use some of these tools to accomplish the same goals. Uh, so that's a lot of when you see, you know, our, our, our blog posts around experimenting and, and fledge mm -hmm. and such, we're just running our own tests uh, with a fledge-based audience versus a traditional-based audience and seeing, you know, how close is it in terms of performance and then tweaking. And then what we're, we're going to challenge all of you to do is to do the same thing for your own business. You know, to use your these platform, our platforms over time as we release these features to try it. So, you know, I think this year is a good one to start, you know, finding moments to test, to look at more probabilistic modeling approaches for understanding how the advertising is going, to build better first party data connections with consumers, to be able to like start a path down that road. There's a lot of good foundational work. That's what we're encouraging people to do. And then next year is going to be a big year for transition out of this uh, cookie based infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So there aren't any other questions listed right now, but I want to give everyone an opportunity if you do have questions. Along the right side panel um, of the webinar, there's a little section called questions. You can type them in there and then we'll, we'll be happy to answer any. So let's give everyone just a couple moments here to see if there are any additional questions. And if not, um, then we'll close this out. Perfect. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. So it looks like we were crystal clear in, in everything that we shared today. So that's huge kudos to Jeremy, Bill, and Betsy. Oh, we did. One come in. All right. So can we elaborate on the use of GA360 versus GA free in this transition? Jeremy, I'll direct that one to you as well. You know, I, it's funny. I, I We focus very much, my sales team, on the the paid product, uh, you know, it's a, yeah. a license sale versus a free product. Um, our, our investment is very much in GA360 and the new version that we're calling GA4 that we'll be launching that incorporates a lot of like app functionality in particular out of Fire, Firebase. Uh, and we'll have obviously a lot of incorporate a lot of these kind of feature proof privacy safe aspects also as, as, as the cookies deprecate. I'm actually going to turn it back to Betsy because I think you guys are in more in the trenches on how the, the feature, you know, feature differentiation between GA free, if you will, and GA paid. Um, I'm just not an expert. I focus almost entirely on the GA paid product and the value proposition and market. Sure. And so I don't want to dodge the question, but I feel like I, there are people here on this call that might know this better than I do. So as a media person, I remember the first time I saw GA360, like having worked in GA free pretty extensively and I saw GA360 and I was like, holy crap, I have all my CM data in here. Like it just, the efficiencies it creates um, in terms of consolidating performance data, media data, et cetera, like within one view and within one platform, um, you know, honestly, that's the biggest, the biggest benefit that I see in terms of having, doing your best to establish more of a single source of truth. Um, of course, there's always limits where Facebook won't allow us to pull in impression data or view through data, et cetera. But um, from what I've seen, just the benefits to media buyers or analytics teams in terms of being able to access a lot more data in one place um, make it really valuable. And I think even more so as, as we move into this world where third party cookies are, are not existent, as we talked earlier about collecting that web and app data, having the best tool and best resource to allow you to do that and use that data is going to become even more important for brands. Yeah, I think, you know, if brands are sort of on the fence or considering it, there's certainly an early adopter advantage now. Um, you get more unsampled data to work with, and it's just, it's faster and more efficient for media and marketing teams overall. Absolutely. So another question just came in. So how do we suggest um, the, or what would be the best path to register, get the beta version for this change? So I think that's a question specific to Google Analytics, Jeremy. Could you repeat the question? I'm not sure if I understood it. Absolutely. So, so um, just asking, what would be the best path to register slash get the beta version for this change? So, I think the answer would be to um, adopt a GA or GA 360. But would love yeah. to give you an opportunity. Yeah, to I, 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 G, being on the paid product will obviously get you better access. You know, we'll filter down 
into three appropriately, but we're in focusing a lot of the more advanced features post cookie deprecation in our in our licensed products first and foremost. So obviously that that that's important. I think in terms of access to features within that, like you know, so the the, the sandbox capabilities of Flay, mm -hmm. Fledge and Flock, and other things like that, that still is being determined. Like we're still developing that technology um, and deploying it. We will push that out through our partners, you know, primarily, honestly. So working with the Delve is important. It allows you to, you know, be able to, they, they will have preferential access versus like that Joe average, you know, consumer, because we have, you know, somebody that we can work with, to, you know, get feedback on betas and, and product launches. So, um, and somebody that's honestly an expert within the, the space. So, you know, relying heavily. So I think, I mean, those that are here are in the right place, you know, using the paid product, working with the partner with Delve are probably the best things you can do right now. And, uh, we'll bring that to market as quickly as we can, as it's available and as we can scale it. Yeah, absolutely. And just to double down on your comment about partners, I think that is a really important element here at, at Delve. And as Betsy mentioned, we're really pushing our partners and our clients rather now to get ahead and understand what the opportunities are for them. How can they prepare themselves? Um, and that may be a little bit more than what you know the average client could do. Perfect. One other question here as we as we come up to our last couple minutes. So as if cookies go away, how does this impact conversion in AdWords? Do we expect conversions to degrade? So I'll throw that to the group. Betsy, Jeremy, you, you guys may be the best I, one. That, that's something we care deeply about. And, and, and I mentioned earlier like, that there was a tremendous amount of modeling in our conversion already because of the lack of data that we're seeing already mm -hmm. disappear from the ecosystem. We're just ramping that up further. Um, I will say very confidently that Google has engineers that understand like modeling ML and other capabilities to understand from a small piece of data about how to extrapolate to how that works and be able to do conversion modeling appropriately. One of the most basic things you can do is be on GA. Um, GA, uh, you know, like having GA, having our Google tags on your site will allow for much better conversion modeling within a Google Ads infrastructure. Like it is a foundational thing we're focusing on is using um, GA or, you know, other, there are other Google tag solutions, but I think we particularly believe in GA uh, to be able to like get good resolution on the value of Google Ads spent. It's just a, it's a, it's a simple thing to do and it provides tremendous benefit when you're doing search or YouTube. So that it, it's a simple thing, but it opens up a lot of doors. And, and there's a huge commitment within the company to really improve our conversion capabilities and modeling. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much. We're coming right up on time here. Really appreciate.